Good news, good news. No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Mark Teske, your host for Good News Today. I want to thank you for joining us. We've got a great program today, and here's what's coming up. We'll begin with our devotional time, as we always do, and that consists of a scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of that scripture. Today we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 11, verses 11 through 15, a passage where Jesus gives John the baptizer a great compliment. To get out your Bibles, turn to Matthew 11. I'll meet you there in just a moment. Following our devotional time, Troy Spradlin joins us to repair our understanding about the roadmap of salvation. Jim Dearman joins us with some more wisdom. Today he'll be talking about things that you don't need to advertise. We'll see what that's about in just a few moments. Then Cody Boston comes to us from Cody's Corner, and he's continuing his series on the parable of the sower. Today, he's looking at the thorny soil. In our final segment, we have a Bible question for Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin. Is it okay for our family to watch Sunday services on TV and participate from home? It's a great question, and I hope you stay tuned. I also hope that you have your Bibles opened up to Matthew chapter 11, where we read beginning at verse 11. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew chapter 11 begins, John the baptizer has just been arrested and thrown into prison. By the time we get to chapter 14, we'll learn about John's eventual execution by Herod. Now, 
as Jesus and John were both working during this period of time, there's some confusion about which prophecies point to Jesus and which point to John. Uh, the crowds knew that they were both great men, but they didn't know how the two of them fit, fit into the prophecies, which pointed to Jesus and which pointed to John. In verses 4 through 6 of this passage, Jesus points to his miracles to prove that he was the Messiah. Right after that, Jesus then begins to compliment John. He was a steadfast preacher. He was more than a prophet. And then he describes their relationship by quoting from Malachi 3, which reads, Behold, I send my messenger, that would be John, he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So Jesus set forth John's role as the one in preparation. The one that Malachi also says is like John the Baptist. And he sets forth the prophecies that state that Jesus is indeed God. He will prepare the way before me, says the Lord, there in Malachi 3.1. The Lord will co suddenly come to his temple. He will be the messenger of the covenant, a new covenant that's coming. And the text under consideration tells us that nobody was greater than John the Baptist up until that point. Not Abraham, the one the Jews looked up to with great pride. Not Moses, the one who talked to God face to face. Not Elijah, who was carried up in a whirlwind and didn't see death. Not David, the great king. None of them was greater than John. But Jesus also said the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. This also means that the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than all of those Old Testament heroes. The Hebrew writer explains that it's because we're part of a better covenant based upon better promises, Hebrews 8, verse 6. So what Jesus is trying to do is get the Jews not being caught up in being children of Abraham. There's something even better, this new covenant. The whole purpose of that old covenant and the prophets and John was to point to Christ. Galatians 3.24 tells us, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Colossians 2.14 tells us the old law was nailed to the cross. And Hebrews chapter 8 quotes from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, a prophecy that there would be a new covenant coming. He goes on in verse 13 to say, in that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So what's the result? The result is we need to listen to Jesus regarding matters of salvation. Notice the words that he said right before he was ascended into heaven. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Well, that's consistent with what we've just talked about. Then he commands them, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. You see, Jesus is saying, this is how you obey me. He said, Mark's account in Mark chapter 16, go into the, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Salvation can be yours if you do what Jesus says to do, and that's good news for us today. Now it's time for Troy Spradlin. Today he's looking at the roadmap of salvation. Is it taking you where you want to go? Why does the plan of salvation seem so difficult for some people to grasp? You know, the Bible clearly teaches that in order for one to be saved, they must Hear the gospel, John 5.24, Romans 10.17.
believe in Jesus, John 8, 24, John 3, 16. Repent of their sins in Luke 13, 3 or Acts 2, 38. Confess that Jesus is the Son of God in Matthew 10, verse 32 and Romans 10, 9. And be baptized for the remission of sins, Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38 and Acts 22, 16. You see, this pattern is confirmed once and again in every conversion story that we read about in the book of Acts. However, as you study the different conversions, such as the 3,000 on Pentecost or the Ethiopian eunuch or the Philippian jailer and others, you'll notice that not every step is always mentioned. And unfortunately, there are those who will choose a single verse and then teach that certain steps are not necessary for salvation because they weren't mentioned. Well, let's repair our understanding by using what I like to call the roadmap analogy. Suppose you were to ask me for directions from, let's say, Nashville, Tennessee to Austin, Texas. Well, I might say, okay, get on I-40 and head west towards Memphis and go through Memphis onto Little Rock, Arkansas. Then take I-30 down towards Texarkana and on to Dallas, Texas, and at Dallas, get on I-35E and go south to Austin. So what have I done? Well, I've given you several details and several specific waypoints on how to get from Nashville to Austin. All right, so now suppose that you start your journey and you get onto Little Rock. There you meet a friend and you decide, I'm going to stay here for a day or two. And after your visit, you decide to continue your journey. And once again, you call me for directions. Now, does it make any sense for me to start by saying, get on I-40 and head west towards Memphis and go through Memphis onto Little Rock, Arkansas? No, <laughs> because you're already in that place. I just simply need to start from where you are. So does that imply that the previous directions that I gave you are void or unnecessary if perhaps someone else wants to travel from Nashville to Austin? Well, no, they're still necessary. And most people are capable of understanding this. Well, the plan of salvation in the Bible works exactly the same way. But for some reason, people don't seem to apply the same rules to the Bible that they would giving directions to go to a city. Now consider this. Why didn't Peter ask those men to believe before telling them to repent in Acts 2.38? Well, it's because they already had belief. Why didn't Ananias tell Paul to believe, repent, confess before telling him to arise and be baptized in Acts 22.16? Well, it's because he already believed, he was already penitent, and he confessed Jesus when he said, Lord, what would you have me do in Acts 22, verse 10? Or did Philip need to tell the Ethiopian eunuch to repent before telling him to confess? No, he said, if you believe in all your heart, you may in Acts 8, verse 37. You see, the eunuch already had belief. He had already repented. He just needed to finish the last two steps. So in each case, the evangelist starts with where the convert was in the process. He didn't need to mention every step. And this is the reason why not every step must be mentioned in every single conversion case. This is why Jesus can simply say, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, and it is perfectly sufficient without having to mention every single element. But every step still is just as important and necessary because remember, the Bible says, the sum of thy word is truth in Psalm 119, verse 160. Thanks for making that so clear, Troy. Our journey toward salvation takes several steps. Where are you on that journey? Have you made it to your final destination yet? If you'd like to study more about what Troy just talked about, you can do so through our free Bible correspondence course. It encourages you to read for yourself and see what the Bible says about these topics. We want you to spend more time in the Bible and see it for yourself rather than just take somebody's word for it. In just a moment, we'll give you our contact information so that you can send us your contact information. 
Then Jim Dearman's going to be with us. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1 877 384 7221. That's 1 877 384 7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. Remember, you can enroll in our correspondence course right on the website, gnttv.org. Just click where it says Bible Course, fill out the information, and we'll get a course right out to you. Don't forget, you can always listen to us on our channel on truth.fm. Now here's Jim Dermott with some sound words about advertising. We will live eternally. One winter, years ago, I saw a message on a motel sign which read, Warm Rooms. My reaction was not, oh, that's a place I would like to stay. They have warm rooms. My first response was more like, would I want to stay in a motel where they advertise the fact that their rooms are warm? Wouldn't I expect that anyway? After all, Warm rooms are not exactly a bonus at a motel in winter. And since they didn't mention running water, would there be a possibility they don't have it? The moral here seems to be, there are some things you don't need to advertise. This is true of the Christian. He doesn't tell others all that he does as a Christian. He just does it because it is what is expected of him. In Luke 17, 10, the Lord pointed out that When we've done all that's commanded of us, we've only done what is our duty. When one considers all the Lord has done for him, his response will be to give his all in serving the one who first loved him, 1 John 4, 19. Others will see his light through his deeds without his having to shine it by his declarations. We will live eternally. Christianity is indeed much more appreciated when it is clearly seen and not just heard. Thanks for those thoughts, Jim. If you haven't downloaded our app and explored it yet, I encourage you to do so. You can find it in the App Store for your phone, for your tablet, for your Roku, your Apple TV, or your Kindle Fire. Download the app and explore the teaching that can be found right there. Now, Cody Boston continues his series on the parable of the sower from Matthew 13. Go ahead and turn your Bibles there right now. He comes to us from Cody's Corner. Welcome to Cody's Corner. Today I want to go back to a familiar parable in Matthew chapter 13 and talk about the parable of the sower. A particular soil is where I would like to focus, and it is the the thorny soil. If you will, open your Bibles to Matthew 13, and let's look at a couple of verses together as we examine the thorny soil and if our hearts are that type of soil. In Matthew 13, beginning in verse 7, it says, Some seed, that is, fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. We all have a desire to be good seed, when it comes to receiving the Word of God. In fact, I believe that's why you've tuned in to this program is because you want to try to evaluate your heart each week and you want to make sure that it's a heart that's receptive, a heart that's loving and kind and willing to obey the Word of God, the will of God. In order for us to have the right kind of heart, we have to realize the dangers of having the wrong kind of heart. The thorny soil is a type of soil, a heart that there are things there that choke the life out of the seed. Yes, it begins to grow and spring up, 
But because of the presence of certain things, because of the presence of these thorns, those thorns will choke the life out. Even though there's life and vibrance and excitement to begin with, the thorns don't allow it to last. In fact, when you go back to Matthew 13 and you look at the text that we were just in, you jump over to where the parable is explained for us and you drop down and, and look at verse 21, or 22 rather. It says, Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Are there cares in this world that you won't let go of? We've talked about obstacles in another lesson that keep the seed from getting deep into our hearts. But are there things there that even when the seed grows, that it will choke the life out? Maybe it is certain relationships, people that bring us down when we're trying to stay up for the Lord, people that ridicule us because of our faith and because of that relationship uh, it keeps us from really being able to fully commit to God and, and to the kingdom. What relationships are in your life that could be thorns and could be keeping God's Word from truly growing in your heart? I ask you to examine that this week. Take some time and pray. Think about the type of, of soil your heart is. Ask if there's anything there that is keeping God's Word from living, anything that's choking the life out of it. And if there is, remove it. Realize that certain relationships can keep you down and you need to get rid of them in order to get back up and get focused on what you need to be doing for the kingdom. Well, that's it for my corner of the world. I hope you have a blessed day. Thanks, Cody. We've got a great way for you to start every day, and that's with a Good News Today podcast. Just search for Good News Today Daily Devotional Time wherever you get your podcast, and start every day with your daily dose of good news. In just a moment, we'll give our Bible question to Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin. They'll answer it from the Bible after this brief break. Now we have a Bible question for Guyton and Troy. Is it okay for our family to watch Sunday services on TV and participate from home? Hey, Troy. Yes. Uh, did you know I, I went to the Super Bowl? You went to the Super Bowl? I never told you that. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, man, it was so awesome. I virtually went there when I turned it on television. Oh, you <laughs> you got me. You virtually went. There's a difference between going to the Super Bowl, which got me excited, and virtually being there. Yeah, I've, I've never set in a stadium okay. while it was being played. There's a difference, brother. <laughs> there, there is. Okay. Well, that kind of has to do with today's question. Okay. Because the question as it reads is, is it okay for our family to watch Sunday services on TV and participate from home? Ah, so there's the idea of virtual versus being in the presence. Yeah. And, and without having more, you know, to give us a context of the question, uh, I want to clarify in, at the get go that, you know, if you're sick at home or you uh, maybe have assembled with your church and, and you have an online, uh, maybe a few time zones away and you want to watch it, is that okay to do? Certainly that's Absolutely. all right to do. Yeah. But I really think this question is coming from the angle of, is it okay for our family to watch Sunday services on TV? Instead and, of going and assembling. Exactly. Because okay. that's what we seem to be hearing a lot. Yes. And this is, this is a holdover from covid I mean, people had to stay home in some cases. And so, you know, there are still people who are still watching from home instead of returning to services. 
Exactly. And, and the simple answer is if you're able to assemble and, and I always remind people, the Lord knows if you can or not. That's right. But if you're able to assemble with the church, the assembly is something that is requiring you to come together in person mm-hmm. to accomplish the task at hand. And, you know, in Hebrews 10, verse 25, it talks about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the, sum is, as the manner of some is. I always remind people, back up into that verse, you know, before you get to verse 25. Mm-hmm. Remember, what is the point of us coming together? Well, it's to provoke one another unto love and good works. And when you think about that one another aspect of the assembly, exactly, it's critical because Colossians 3.16 talks about that we are to teach and admonish one another in Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Mm-hmm. So when I sit in my house and I may sing along with something on the television or on my phone, the aspect that is missing is the one another because as I lift my voice, I'm not admonishing my brother Great and provoking point. them unto love and Great good works. Great point. Well, that and the word ecclesia, which means assembly, is in the Bible more than a hundred times in the New Testament. And so you think God wanted to tell us something about gathering together? And then over and over in places like 1 Corinthians 11, that passage we use for communion in verse 20, it says, when you have gathered together in one place. Mm -hmm. We see the same thing in, in Acts, in Acts chapter 20. We always go to verse 7 to talk about the Lord's Supper there as well, and the first day of the week. But in verse 8, it says there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. Over and over and over, the idea, as you said, of one another or being gathered together is shown as our example of what we're supposed to do as the church, the church, the body of Jesus Christ. And so watching it on television, the the Internet, you know, if that's all you can do because of sickness, you know, immobility, you cannot get out for some reason. You know, we're not saying you're wrong for that, but it is not a substitute that is acceptable to God for his church assembling, coming together, fulfilling the acts of worship. Amen. I definitely prefer spending time with my family in person rather than just having a video chat with them. That was a great and balanced response to that question. We'd like to encourage you to check what we've taught in this program against the teachings in the Word of God. You can watch or listen to the program again if you need to hear it again. You can go to our website, to our apps, to our channel, or to our podcast. And as you're listening, you can always pause, check it in the Bible, make sure that you're hearing the right thing, and see it for yourself. If you have any questions, contact us. We love to hear from our audience. We might even answer your question on the program. Remember, we love you, we're praying for you, and we want you to make it to heaven. Good news, good news, good news, there is good news today. There is good news, good news, the world always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today. All around the world, good news, always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today.